take a cloud that Mother Nature or God has provided and you alter that cloud. Well, the reason the cloud doesn't expand on its own in most cases is the fact that there's a lot of moisture, but there's no nuclei. There's nothing for the moisture to stick to. So when you provide the silver iodide nuclei, it causes the water to coalesce to that nuclei. And when it does, it releases heat, which means everything starts to rise. If you produce enough nuclei at the right places in a cloud, there's essentially no limit to how fast and how far it'll grow because it just keeps releasing heat as it goes up. And of course, the heat keeps trying to rise. So with the nuclei, it's very small and they're put off by these flares, but then water starts attracting to it and then it builds condensation. Well, you, you put out a gillion of these, put out a gillion of these uh, uh, silver iodide nuclei and they attract water. They just sponge it up. But when they do, that water condenses and it releases what they call the late heat of condensation. The heat goes out of it oh. and the whole thing starts rising. If you're in the business of trying to kill clouds, then of course you go up to the area where there are uh, some vertical shear, the wind blowing some direction or other, and you provide the nuclei at a level above where the raindrops are. They are then so light that the, that the wind vertical shear merely blows the top of the cloud away. Then there's no place for the coalescence or the nucleation to take place. We were the first ones to fly into hurricanes for the purpose of modifying them, uh, if you will. That was Project Storm Fury. I began to, to be extremely confident that we could, could do whatever we, about what we wanted to with a hurricane. The Project Storm Fury had been going on since 1961, and they had already done, or had done two experiments, one in 61 and 63. Well, by 1964, when I was there in 1964, I wrote the plan and, and uh, started to have a track and a mission for every flight that was uh, on the hurricane cloud cheating experiments. So we had documentation for everything. Operation and product storm fury are very positive. This report said that we claim they should consider now if a hurricane heads straight towards Miami. I was only as high as you could get. I got interested in, in weather modification when I was a farm boy. Uh, I never could understand why the clouds wasn't bigger, had a little more shade, and was chopping that cotton. So I got in the Navy. Uh, I managed to get into meteorology school, and I think that's really where I learned the most of my physics. I was assigned to the Typhoon Squadron in, in Guam, where I served for three years as a flat, flat meteorologist and uh, meteorological engineer. From there, I came back to some additional school at Texas a and University down in Kingsville. And from, from Kingsville, they sent me to uh, the Hurricane Hunter Squadron in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. That squadron, of course, had just become involved in Project Storm Fury. So when I reported to, uh, to that duty station as a meteorological engineer, I was immediately uh, uh, designated the uh, military member of the Storm Fury Advisory Board. We were doing quite a lot of testing work out over the uh, test range at Chine Lake, California, where we uh, dropped cloud seeding flares or silver iodide generators into clouds or just where we wanted to to see what the reaction was. And it was there when I learned for sure that you could really change a cloud by the amount of silver iodide you put in it and where you put it data from California EPA confirming aluminum contamination in waterways throughout California. This is from Cal EPA. There's about 26 lab tests in here confirming that there is aluminum barium strontium in our air, what we're all breathing here, we're all exposed to. We face a lot of legitimate challenges here. I agree with you. I agree with uh, a lot of points brought up, but I would ask anybody in the room, what challenges will we face if we're inhaling aluminum on a day-in, day-out basis? If our streams are contaminated with aluminum, how can we prepare when our soils no longer grow properly, when we have a UV issue that's off the charts. So when we have Cal EPA stating that this is not in their jurisdiction, these climate modification programs that are absolutely going on, we have CARB saying not in their jurisdiction, Shasta County saying not in their jurisdiction, 
Um, I would like to ask, since we know maybe these programs, maybe maybe the federal EPA, because they're trying to take over every mud puddle and ditch and backyard pond in the it. world. So part of maybe it. somebody will find it. Right? It is part of it. Water rights are being pursued, and we know the drought is a two plus two equals four equation. We have the the, the satellite imagery to prove it up. So. I'm going to hand this data off to you. I have a copy for you and for your staff. My question would be this. Since nobody, everybody is passing the buck here, will your office address the fact that we have an absolute positively like a heavy metal contamination issue that cannot be disputed? It's a public health hazard. We have a, a UV radiation issue that's so intense it's burning the bark off of trees. All appear to be related to these pro climate modification programs, but these issues are indisputable public health hazards. Since nobody else will address it, will your office address it? the runaway greenhouse nightmare, a panel of international scientists and military officials announced Operation Storm Destroyer, a new plan to weaken the superstorms ravaging the globe. Project so, Papa. are we really able to change the weather? We have tried before with some success. Operation Storm Fury. Project Popeye. For nearly 20 years, the U.S. government ran a program called Project Storm Fury. Their mission was to weaken supercell storms by seeding them with chemicals. And they found out they could create them as well. In theory, we can weaken a storm by selectively seeding it with silver iodide. Silver iodide particles are hydroscopic. That means they attract water. So when silver iodide particles are dropped into a rain cloud, they draw the water to them, forming raindrops. As rain falls out of the cloud, the storm weakens. And they can do the opposite. So if a quick succession of storms begin to ravage the planet, nations with experience in seeding may come together to fight back. We have scheduled about 30 minutes for this press conference. With the eventual impacts of the current environment yet unclear, maintain spacing interval 90 seconds and the constant threat of natural disaster. Approaching minimums. And America stands ready as a partner to provide stability for all. Okay, Kevin, Ryan, Through um, things such as, because I, I very much prefer quoting a very official source, uh, the majority of my material in this lecture has been either taken from the CDC, Center for Disease Control, Bethesda, Maryland University, uh, particularly in the study department of neurosystemic disease. And I've also taken my material from Dr. Mercola's site and a few other British journals and British sources. When I began to investigate these diseases, I was appalled and shocked to affirm some material that I had come across years ago. However, this material, which at the time was non-conventional, has become conventional. In this lecture, I hope to show you that fibromyalgia, MS, Parkinson's, ALS, Alzheimer, chronic fatigue syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, even heart disease, and the list goes on, are all stemming on the same covert weaponized pathogen. From the same covert weaponized pathogen. Weaponized pathogen. Weaponized pathogen? Biowarfare. Okay, follow the lecture. You'll get it. Biowarfare. As well as the associative co-infections. So we're going to go into the material and take a... Ultimately, we're going to look for the wizard. Do you know what I mean? Remember the Wizard of Oz? Don't look behind the curtain. We're going to look behind the curtain. So prepare. Okay, the title page of a genuine U.S. Senate study declassified February 24th, 1977, and this is scary, shows that Dr. George Merck of the pharmaceutical company Merck Sharp Dome, which now makes the cures for the diseases that they one time created, reported in 1946 to the U.S. Secretary of War that his research had managed for the first time to isolate a disease agent in crystalline form. Do you know what that means, a disease agent in crystalline form? What it means is they isolated the disease itself from the bacterial. So they took a bacterium, they isolated the disease, 
and they then had it in crystalline form. And why is that important? They had produced a crystalline bacteria from the Brucilla, uh, Brucilla bacterium. The, the bacterial toxin could be removed in crystalline form and stored, transported, and deployed without deterioration. So if you know the history of biowarfare agents, ultimately what they've been looking for is something that is not an acute epidemic, but something rather that would be covert, adaptive, and unable to be found. This is why it was so fundamentally important for them to extract and something that would be safe to be stored and able to be transported. It could be delivered by vectors such as insects, aerosols, the food chain. In nature, it's delivered within the bacterium via prions. Even in nature, in our agriculture now, we are finding prion crystals, weaponized prion crystals. <clears throat> so they were investigating into insects. They were investigating with infecting mosquitoes and setting them loose. And then all of us have seen this over all of our cities. The sprays. Jet sprays. Chemtrails. Somebody was talking to me yesterday about um, a particular man who's been collecting rain samples, snow samples all over the world and looking at what's coming through, and he's finding things like cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus. Of course, as we get further into understanding things such as the mycoplasma, what you're gonna see is that the mycoplasma itself is undetectable. It has been designed to be undetectable and not able to be observed by design. So we've all seen this. We all know that these epidemics are prevalent. And how many of you are seeing more fibro clients, more Lyme clients, more ALS clients, MS clients in your practice than ever before? What we're seeing statistically, if you actually look at the statistics right now, is that by 2025, all of these neurosystemic diseases will hit doubling points. Presently, for an example, Lyme disease right now is the fifth most reported disease in the United States and the number one vector, and this was directly through the Center for D Disease Control, the number one vector disease in the US. Climate engineering programs are nothing short of weather warfare on innocent populations. And how are these operations further fueling unprecedented wildfires first? The desiccant particles being sprayed by the geoengineers are drying out the atmosphere and reducing overall atmospheric relative humidity. This graph clearly reveals a steady decline in atmospheric relative humidity from the late 1940s when geoengineering programs were initially deployed. Atmospheric relative humidity must increase on a warming world. The laws of physics make this clear. The only way atmospheric relative humidity can decline is if there is a factor that's not being acknowledged or admitted to by the experts for reasons already stated. That factor is geoengineering. Climate engineering operations are completely disrupting the evaporative cycle, convection, wind, and thus the entire hydrological cycle. Extreme drought and deluge is now the norm.